First, we're going to start with some high yield uses. So let's say that you have a patient who's pregnant and they're hypertensive. You need to know what drug you can and cannot give them. There are four drugs that you can use to treat high blood pressure in a pregnant patient. They are hydralazine, methyl dopa, labetalol, and nifedipine. The mnemonic to remember this is that hypertensive moms love nifedipine. Hydralazine, methyl dopa, labetalol, and nifedipine. Now, as you can see by this slide and for the rest of the video, it's going to kind of be a laundry list of facts that you need to memorize, but we're going to do our best to break it down and give you mnemonics along the way. So our first one is that hypertensive moms love nifedipine. The HMLN drugs are the ones you use to treat hypertension in pregnant patients. Next, the patient needs an NSAID but has gastric ulcers or some other form or risk of bleeding. So usually they'll tell you that the patient... They'll, they'll describe a patient who needs an NSAID. You'll know that. But what you might overlook in the question stem is that the patient either has active or a past history of gastric ulcers, or they have some other bleeding risk. You need to say to yourself mentally, okay, I can't give them a classic COX-1 inhibitor. So what do you give them? You give them celecoxib. Celecoxib is high yield because it's the only COX-2 inhibitor. So it becomes high yield in patients who need to be on an NSAID but can't be on a classical COX-1 inhibitor. That's high yield. Next, the patient is placed on heparin and gets heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. First step, what do you do? You stop the heparin, and then you get them on a direct thrombin inhibitor, like a gatraban. This is high yield because tons of patients are on heparin. People get heparin prophylaxis when they come into the hospital. So if they develop heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which you know clinically is pretty rare, but on tests is very common, you stop the heparin, you put them on a direct thrombin inhibitor. Next, the patient needs furosemide but has a sulfa allergy. So first high yield fact right off the bat is that you need to know that furosemide is a sulfa drug. So you could get this type of question where they describe a patient who has an allergy to such and such. They'll name a random sulfa drug. And then they'll tell you that the patient went into heart failure or was volume overloaded. They were started on a loop diuretic like furosemide, and then all of a sudden they developed a terrible side effect profile. And you need to say in your head, oh, they're allergic to sulfa drugs. So the question is, what do you put them on? They still need to be on a loop diuretic because they need to diurese all of that volume out of their body, but they can't be on furosemide. The answer is, is ethacrinic acid. Ethacrinic acid is a loop diuretic, but it's not a sulfa drug. So someone with a sulfa allergy can still tolerate it. Next, what are the two drugs, or there are many, but what are the two highest yield drugs that cause gynecomastia? Gynecomastia is caused by spironolactone and ketoconazole, among other things. There are certainly, don't get me wrong, there are other drugs that cause gynecomastia, but these are the two most likely to show up on your exam. Spironolactone, because it's such a commonly used drug if they have it, you switch them to a plerinone. You can keep blocking the aldosterone receptor, but they won't experience gynecomastia. Ketoconazole is also high yield because it's a very, very big mainstay of antifungal treatment. So if you get a question stem and a patient has a fungus, they're started on ketoconazole, and all of a sudden they get boobies, you're thinking, okay, gynecomastia, we got to get them off that drug. Same thing for spironolactone. These are the two highest yield. You got to keep this in mind because question stems are going to try to get you and kind of uh, coerce you into thinking that the patient might be abusing anabolic steroids, but no, they're just taking their routine drugs. So that's very high yield. Next, let's talk about the diuretics. The diuretics are probably the highest yield class of drugs that you'll deal with on your, on your step one or level one. Hypercalcemia is caused by thiazides. Hypocalcemia is caused by loop diuretics. So the mnemonic to remember this is that loops lose. Loops lose calcium. Loops lose hypocalcemia. The other random facts that you want to be familiar with is that thiazides cause hyperuricemia. So if someone has gout, they'll worsen their gout. And you want to know that loop diuretics like furosemide cause ototoxicity. So these four facts are probably the highest yield side effects of the diuretics. If you know the mechanism of the diuretics, you can kind of reason through the other side effects like um, the changes in potassium levels and all that stuff. But these are the high yield facts that you want to know kind of um, irrespective of the mechanisms. Next, let's talk about toxicity. So ototoxic and nephrotoxic. Ototoxicity is your aminoglycosides, your loop diuretics like furosemide, cisplatin, which is a chemotherapeutic agent, and ASA. 
nephrotoxic, the biggies are going to be aminoglycoside and amphotericin B. So you can see that aminoglycoside is both ototoxic and nephrotoxic. So I always used to say to myself, aminoglycoside. I capitalized that N-O in my head, and the N stood for nephrotoxic, and the O stood for ototoxic. So no, you don't want to give aminoglycoside to anybody with hearing or kidney problems. Um, and then for amphotericin B, I used to remember amphoterable. It's amphoterrible because it's nephrotoxic, it causes phlebitis, so you can also memorize it as amphlebitis or amphoterrible, it's up to you. But these are high yield, so know them. Next, dilated cardiomyopathy, your two biggies are going to be first, alcohol, and second, doxorubicin slash danorubicin, which are chemotherapeutic drugs. Alcohol's easy, you, you, they get them off the alcohol, tell them to stop drinking. Um, as far as the chemo drug, you treat with dexrazoxane. So if you have a patient who has some type of cancer, they're being treated with doxorubicin and all of a sudden they develop uh, heart failure and it's determined that they have a dilated cardiomyopathy, you give them dexrazoxine, you stop the doxorubicin and you kind of continue them on their course with another drug. This is high yield. Dilated cardiomyopathy is high yield because you're going to have a patient who's doing nothing wrong but all of a sudden they go into heart failure and you got to figure out why. Next, let's talk about the different, I'll call this my color slide. If they have orange bodily secretions, it's rifampin, one of the tuberculosis drugs. They could pee orange, their, their tears could be orange, but it doesn't matter. If it's orange or red, it's, it's rifampin. This is not harmful to the patient. It's totally fine. This is a completely benign side effect, so don't be worried about this. Red man syndrome, that's going to be vancomycin. It causes a really bad kind of flushing reaction that I believe can be prevented with NSAIDs. But red man syndrome, you want to think about vancomycin. Gray baby syndrome, you think chloramphenicol. Okay, so these are your three different colors to be aware of, the color side effects, as I like to call them. Next, this is extremely high yield. Agranulocytosis, you think clozapine, one of the atypical antipsychotics. So they're going to describe a patient who's psychotic, blah, blah, blah. You put them on a drug. The question is going to ask you, what do you need to do or what do you need to monitor? And the answer is going to be a CBC because they're hinting that they were put on clozapine. You need to watch for agranulocytosis. So you get... You get CBCs routinely so you can make sure that they're not um, experiencing this side effect. And the mnemonics, remember this, is monitor your CBC closely, like clozapine. Monitor it closely. CBC for agranulocytosis, that's really high yield. This shows up on everybody's exam. Next, drug-induced lupus, another really high yield one. Hydralazine, isoniazid, procainamide, methyl dopa, and quinidine. There's really no good way to, remem to remember the drugs. You kind of just have to memorize them. But as far as remembering the antibody, you're going to see an antihistone antibody. And just remember that you get histoned off of drugs. So histoned for antihistone and drugs for drug-induced lupus. This is really high yield. A lot of the drugs on this slide have multiple side effects, but this usually shows up on exam, so I would definitely know this one. Next. Cough and angioedema, that's going to be your ACE inhibitors. If someone's put on an ACE, which is a first-line treatment for high blood pressure, and they get swelling around the face, they get a really bad dry cough, you switch them to an ARB. It's also high yield to know that the mechanism behind this is due to a buildup of bradykinin. So um, <clears throat> ACE, as an enzyme, breaks down bradykinin. So when you inhibit it, there's a buildup of bradykinin, and that buildup of bradykinin causes the dry cough and angioedema. So it's really high yield to know that. Um, totally unrelated, we're going to move on to hemorrhagic cystitis. This is caused by cyclophosphamide. If they have hemorrhagic cystitis while in cyclophosphamide, you treat them with a drug called mesna. Now, I want to emphasize that the treatment of the side effects for these anti-inflammatory and chemotherapeutic drugs like cyclophosphamide and doxorubicin, these are really high yield. You want to know these associations. So cyclophosphamide, you give them mesna. And I'll test you right now. Do you remember what you give if someone has a dilated cardiomyopathy from doxorubicin? You give them dexrazoxane. So I'm just kind of testing you here, but it's really high yield to know what you treat the classic side effects with. Here's some more. Cartilage damage in children, you want to think fluoroquinolones. This is the reason we don't give fluoroquinolones to children or um, young adolescents. Bone or tooth damage, it chelates the bone or the tooth, the matrix within that, that's going to be tetracyclines. Again, we don't give tetracyclines to pregnant patients or young children for this reason. Prolonged QT syndrome, there's four drugs I want you to associate with this. Azithromycin, which is an antibiotic, 
and then three types of antiarrhythmics, class 1A, class 1C, and class 3. You need to know which drugs fall into those classes because you need to be able to identify that drug as potentially prolonging the QT, but it's really high yield to know that the mechanism of why those drugs prolong the QT is because they affect the potassium current in the cardiac action potential, and when you affect the potassium current, you're going to prolong your QT. So those are the classes that do that. Note that class 1Bs do not affect the potassium current, and therefore they do not prolong the QT. The next slide, hemolysis in a G6P deficient patient. You want to think quinidine, sulfonamides, and isoniazid. So isoniazid does a ton of shit. You really want to know what it does. I have a slide coming up next. It's our last slide that will kind of summarize it, but um, hemolysis in G6P deficient patients, think of these three. Last slide, and probably one of the highest yield, is going to be your TB drugs. So there's a mnemonic that I actually came up with. You say RIPE on GO. This helps you memorize the order of the drugs and then the order of the main side effects. So RIPE for rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. On GO stands for orange secretions, neuropathy, gout, and optic neuritis. If you memorize that, that'll get you through 98% of the questions about the TB drugs and their side effects. The other things you need to know are the other side effects of isoniazid, which I kind of touched on in other slides. But just to reiterate, drug-induced lupus, hemolysis in a G6P deficient patient, and a really high-yield one that we haven't yet talked about but I'm going to talk about now is a B6 deficiency, which is partly the reason you get a neuropathy. So it's sort of like kind of messed within neuropathy, but it's its own thing. So if you have a patient who has TB, they might say, what would you expect to find on labs? Um, you could find B6 deficiency. You could find an antihistone antibody for the drug-induced lupus. You could uh, have a positive Coombs test if they have hemolysis, if they're G6P deficient. So you really want to think about how you could take the information they're going to give you in these questions when they describe a TB patient and kind of extrapolate it a step further and predict the side effect profile. So that's my last slide. I told you that this entire video was a long laundry list of things you needed to know. I went through it quickly. I know that. But this is high yield. If you watch this video a few times and you get all of this down, you'll be very well prepared for the high yield side effects and mechanisms that they throw at you on your USMLE or your Comlex. Good luck, guys.